it's not about who's speaking. It's not about, oh, Lord, <laughs> us. Would you just get your eyes focused on my presence? Would you just get your ears attentive to my voice, my spirit calling you? Say it, the Lord. Would you get your eyes and ears, your senses, off of what is going around you, off of what your personal circumstances? Because I'm trying to get you into the mode of where I am, into the dimension of where I am. And if you would seek me, you would find me. Somebody receive that if it bears witness with your spirit. You are near in this place. For without you, Lord, I can do nothing. Without you, oh Lord, I can speak the word. Without you, oh God, I cannot even lift my voice. Without you, oh God, without your spirit empowering, I, there is no value. There is no worth. There is no fulfillment. There is no enjoyment. There is no peace. God, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost so strong.
morning, you're going to start letting go of what other people think of you. So you can step into deeper ministry. So you can step in deeper. Don't be afraid to speak those things. You're not unqualified. Age is not a limit. Age is not a factor. You're called a God for a reason. around you aren't going to be there anymore because he's not only taking you higher he's taking you deeper not everybody is under his shadow not every person you meet is under his shadow shadow. There may not be many people there, but there is comfort in that place. There is hope in that place. There's no trouble in that place. There's only peace in that place. There's only His love in that place. There's only His joy and His grace in the shadow. God's exposing you to His shadow. I release the shadow of the Almighty upon you in the name of Jesus. This is the shadow of the Almighty. This is your shadow. Oh God. trust them and if they trust him you're here because he trusts you you're here because he trusts you with an anointing God it's not about a personality it's not about anybody here. It's about you, Jesus. Lord, the Akaya. Don't let me, oh God, see me when you're trying to convince me to see you. 
God, I don't want people to see me. I don't want them to see this man. But God, most importantly, I don't want myself to see me. I want to be under the shadow where I can't see me. I want to be under the shadow. I want to be under his shadow where I can't find myself. I can't see myself. I can only see him. I want to be under the shadow. I want to be under him where I can't find myself. I want to be under the shadow where nobody can see me and even I can't see myself where I become transparent I become hidden I want to stay under the shadow does anybody want to go under the shadow does anybody want to stay under the shadow where they can't see you you can't see yourself There he is. You're under his shadow. Where it's not about you anymore. You are hid in Christ. You are crucified with him. This is the shadow of his presence. Instruction before we move on. The Lord put this in my. 
my spirit. Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. So why are you trying to make yourself of a reputation when he didn't have it? This is what the Lord was speaking to me this afternoon. If you could just bear with me. I know the presence of God is moving. I just feel very strongly just to set this foundation. There's a wonderful presence of God here. You need to be broken. We need to be broken people. You need to operate under His shadow. Because his shadow prevents you from being seen. I told the Lord this. I said, God, I don't want people to see me. But one thing that's more important than that, I don't want me to see myself. I don't want to be caught up in this where I think I'm doing the work. And I think I'm operating. And I stop believing that scripture that says without me, he can do nothing. I don't want to be so gifted that I start seeing me. And this is what the Lord says. The only way to prevent that is to be under the shadow. In other words, forget yourself. Forget yourself. It's not about you anymore. When you step into the presence of God, hide yourself in his presence. For you can't see yourself anymore. It's not about you. I don't care how gifted I am. I don't care how anointed I am. I don't care how much I wow you with revelation. I want his shadow. I want to be hid in Christ where I can't see myself, where I can't see me. I can only see him. God, I feel the presence of God in this place. Would you worship right now? Would you clap your hands unto the Lord and lift up your voice, lift up your voice, abide in His shadow. I feel electricity flowing right now. I feel electricity in court. If you need healing right now, lift up your hands. If you need healing right now, lift up your hands. In your emotions, in your mind, in your body. into this place, the Lord just told me to bind arthritis. I have no idea why. If you battle with arthritis, I want you to just lift up your hands. In Jesus' name. 
God's about to heal that. He said, if you walk through those doors, you're healed. Legitimately, you are healed. If you walk through those doors, you're going to walk back healed. If you have arthritis, lift up your hands. And I want you to put your hands specifically on the parts that are dealing with arthritis. In Jesus' name, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, from your hips, from your joints, from your ankles, from your back, from your shoulder, from your spine, I bind arthritis. In the name of Jesus, take dominion and authority over those of you that don't have it. Begin to pray for these people. In God, I be ye healed in the name of Jesus. Be ye healed in the name of Jesus. I want you to challenge yourself. The part where it hurts, just begin to exercise it in worship. If it's your hand, lift up your hand. If it's in your feet, begin to run. If it's in your back, begin to worship and dance and jump. It's about him. He's doing the miracle because you're under the shadow. God wants to keep on doing the work. God wants to keep on doing the work.
out low. How much low do you want? That? Depends on how much you yield to Him. For Him to will flow through you. That you truly don't belong to yourself anymore. Your tongue, what you speak, doesn't belong to you anymore. Jesus Christ. And we give thanks unto you, Lord, giving you glory, giving you praise. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Would you pray right now for this Friday's Connect Group and San Clemente in the name of Jesus Christ? Would you pray that God would draw people? Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, would you pray for the Baca family? Lord, for Monique, God, for Sandra and the children, oh Lord. Uh, and when Brother Paul makes the call, oh God, that you prepare their hearts, Father. You prepare their hearts, Lord, to come and be drawn to your people. Uh, that you might, oh God, reach for them and save them, Father. Reveal your word in the name of Jesus Christ. Reveal your word, oh God, in Jesus' name. Come on, would you pray for a little bit right now? Would you stand in the gap? Come on, would you sincerely pray for these souls that God uh, has drawn to his house uh, two Sundays ago, has drawn to you. For you are the house of God, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Lord, flow through us that we may speak the words uh, of eternal life, oh God. Uh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I release strength upon your body, O oh Lord. I release, God, a desire to be, Lord, a labor in the kingdom, to go and teach the world, the word, O oh God, to go and reach the world. To go and proclaim the gospel, oh Lord, to everyone, God, that would listen in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, Lord, for the outreach in the Westminster area, God, that you would, Lord, accomplish your will for that group of people, Father. I pray for the Buena Park Church, oh Lord, for your anointing and your flow, God, to increase. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lose the power of your word upon that area, O oh Lord. Draw the souls, O oh God, to that church, Lord. Draw them in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, 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 God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, praise God. I want you to hear what happened. It was Tuesday, and Dana and Dylan and Brother David were there. And I want to testify. Brother David, you come. We're going to. You may be seated if you want. Just feel led the Holy Ghost to have them share their perspective of what God has done that Tuesday night. In Jesus' name, I believe it is a snapshot what God's going to do. Not only in that area, but here in Jesus' name. 
Praise God. Praise God. God is doing wonderful and marvelous works in Jesus' name. God is in a glimpse of just Tuesday night, just shows the hunger of people. It just shows that people are longing for what we have. And that is avoid being filled with Jesus. And these people are so open. These people are so hungry. We had two witnesses of healing. A man was able to lift up his arm. A man was able to feel no more pain in his back and his hip. Same thing with a woman. No more pain in her back. That's what this world needs. This world's not looking for some watered-down doctrine. This world's not looking for anything else. They want to know, is this real? And through demonstration, through demonstration, through demonstration, we need more conduits. We need more conduits. We need more laborers. The other day, God spoke to me and He said, we have a lot of Pentecostals, but few apostolics. Apostolics are those who are ready to labor. Apostolics are those who live by this word. Apostolics are being led by the Spirit. We need more apostolics. We are done with Pentecostal tradition. We need apostolic movement. We need apostolic demonstration. There's no need to fear. There's no need to fear. There is no need to fear. The Bible says you shouldn't even care about what to carry. Or you should even care notes or scribes or anything to say. God's going to speak through you. God's going to speak through you. He just needs willing vessels. And in these Tuesday nights or this past Tuesday night just shows how hungry people are. How hungry people are. And like Pastor said to me personally, he said it is a fishing ground for souls. It is a fishing ground for souls. And in the name of Jesus, I claim it. I claim it. There is going to be revival. There is going to be revival. There is going to be revival in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It was not my first time there meeting in that that place. And we've been there several several-ish times before. But there was just something different about this time. Any resistance that we had felt previously, it wasn't there. Yeah, there were, there were a couple people who were kind of looking at us weird, kind of like, why are they speaking in tongues? But that resistance was gone, and people were hungry. They were volunteering and asking for prayer so that they could be healed right there on the spot. And he backed up his word. And I believe that in the next coming weeks, if the Lord leads us to continue, continue to visit that place, that there's going to be even more miracles. There's going to be even more miracles because the results of our prayers are being shown. Those, those hours of travail, those hours of intercession, it's not going to waste. He's backing up his word in Jesus' name. I thank God for what he's doing. This time we came, we came a couple of times to this outreach group, but this time, like what Dana was saying, was very different. Um, there was an interesting move of the Holy Ghost, and one thing that really kind of convicted me was the fact that a lot of these people, they're looking for Jesus but they really don't have anybody to tell them who he is. They have nobody to tell them the truth. And it reminds me of that, that, that I, don't, I don't remember what scripture text it is, but it talks about how Jesus had compassion on the multitude because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. 
and going to that Westminster group, it was like seeing sheep without a shepherd. People, they had the opportunity, they had the hunger, but there was nobody that was able to teach them, hey, how do I get the Holy Ghost? Hey, how do I be saved? What do I need to do to enter into eternal life? And that was the big thing for me. And it really, ever since yesterday when we went to that, that outreach group, there was a burden for souls. And church, there are people in this city that desperately need God. But who's going to tell them? It can't just be Pastor Lachica. It can't just be Sister Lachica. We have to be soul winners. We're called to be the church. They're, they have been called to minister to the church. And the church has been called to minister to the world. Where are the soul winners? Where are they? Laborers are few. And Brother Alex, he said this during um, Monday prayer, I think he said. God spoke to him and said, God's not waiting. I think it was God's not waiting on the harvest. He's waiting on us. And we may think, well, where's the harvest? Well, here's the thing. You are the key that unlocks the harvest because in order for God to do something, he has to use somebody. And so it was an amazing experience. Many people, two people were healed, and one person began to have stammering lips. And so we thank God for the revival that he's doing. And we give God all the glory because we're nothing without him. Would you stand right now? Would you pray for the Westminster group in Jesus' name? Father, we pray for your will, Lord, that you would lead us, you would guide us, God, on what to do, what to say, the timing, Lord, of a move of your spirit, God. I pray for Evelyn, Lord, the coordinator, the host of that house, that group, that you would lead her and guide her into all truth, Father. Lord, I know they're thinking about an afternoon service, oh God, and I pray that you would lead us to the timing of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you thank God right now for what he is doing? Would you believe right now that God's going to use you and lead you to a hungry person, that you could teach them the word, that you could be a labor and reap the joy of being a labor, a co-labor with God? commissioned by him, empowered by him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Pray for Evelyn, the host of that house. She was talking to me the other day and wanted to, to see if she started inquiring if we have an afternoon service. Most of the people that go there, there's about 20 to 30 people that usually go. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are hungry. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are just there for the food, but that's all right. But she was inquiring if the lighthouse could have an afternoon service and she would invite them to come. So let's pray for the timing of that in Jesus' name. And those of you that have been there, I know Brother Paul's been there, and Brother John, and Sister Lachica, and... Let's just follow the Holy Ghost, Jesus' name. Uh, remember the announcements, events, they're on the website, stlh.org. And uh, I want to thank God for what he is doing. And remember, the last Sunday of this month is the church and pastoral anniversary of the church, of the Lighthouse. And I'm so thankful for what God ha has been doing. Amen. Are you thankful for the, for the house to worship in Jesus' name? Let's believe for greater things in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, would you pray one more time, Father? We thank you. We bless your name, Lord. I pray that you would, oh God. Uh, Lord, keep leading us. Keep guiding us in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your beautiful presence in the house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. You may be seated. In the back are two of the lesson handouts, lesson 12 and lesson 13, and some of you may already have it. Um, 
Last month, I taught on the subject of God's love, part one, part two, part three. And as I was writing the lessons for the handouts, I felt that it would be more beneficial to make it as three separate lessons. And so part one is entitled as God's love. Part two, I've entitled it as the purpose of the church. And part three, which was, which was more of a oneness lesson, has not yet been completed. In fact, as I was about to start writing that lesson, God said that I needed to do more teaching on that subject. So here we are. And my title for tonight is Knowing the Godhead. And of course, I will be including a review of some points that were made in the previous lesson. And I'm going to start tonight's lesson by asking you this question. When I say the Father and the Son, yeah, Brother John smiling, he knows it's a trick question. How many am I talking about? Smart group, right? My answer is it depends. If we're talking about titles, yeah, it's two, right? But if we're talking about persons or beings, we know that they represent one. Amen? God is one. And, yeah, the previous lesson, we talked more about, we introduced the subject of that. And I'm not going to teach what I taught before, but just to, I'll cover some points, okay? So, if I miss anything, just go back to that lesson um, for last month. Amen. All right. You know, you see, the major confusion with those who believe that there are three persons in the Godhead, or two. And let me say, for those of us who believe that there's one, right, one person in the Godhead, but have a hard time trying to explain that, that's a problem. If we know it, but we can't explain it. We believe it, right? But we have a hard time explaining it. That's not good. Because church, that should not be the case. As like what you testified. What is here is predominantly those who do not rightly divide the word of God. And we're supposed to be those messengers, those Helpers, those teachers, those conduits to help them to know who God really is. Because they do want to know him, amen? They do want to know who they're worshiping. They do want to know who they're raising their hands to. They do want to know it. Because we did, amen? We did. So if we want to truly know God, where do we start? Do we start with creation? Does Genesis 1-1 begin with God? That's John 1-1. Right? Ha ha. Right? So Genesis 1-1 was the beginning of creation, the beginning of time, and the commencement of the plan and the purpose of God. So creation did not begin with God because God was already there. He's already been there. He pre-existed. So to know God we need to start before 
the creation. Okay? During his pre-existence. All right. And this is kind of a little overview of the last time. So before there was anything, there was God. There was God. That's why the first name that he identified himself to us by, especially as his pre-existence, is what? The I am. Right? That's what he told Moses at the burning bush. And I am means the self-existent one. That's what it means, the self-existent one. Not I was or I will, but I am. And he's still the I am today. Since God preexisted and was never created, he had no beginning, right? And we call that is infinite, okay? Infinite. So the I am or the infinite God is not limited by time and space because he created those things, right? Okay? And I said earlier, he had no beginning, okay? He, he's not limited by time and space because time and space comprise the finite, right? Infinite, finite. Big difference, okay? All right. And we've learned that God is love, agape, amen? And so the infinite one or the great I am a man who preexisted is love. And when there was nothing and nobody but God, who was the I am going to fully express himself to? The God of love. Right? Now, I know I taught on that, the Logos, you know, um, but I'm going to make a long story short. Okay? Just listen to the previous lesson if you forgot it. But, um... Make a long story short, the only option that the infinite God had to create the finite so that he could express his love to the finite, okay, he, he had to create, right, a finite because he couldn't create another infinite, right, or that he wouldn't be God, okay? So the only option that the infinite God was was to create the finite. So that he could express his love to the finite, his creation. But the infinite God needed to have a means, okay, whereby he could connect to the finite, his creation, right? Because he's infinite, okay? Infinite, finite, won't work, okay? All right? So... Um, he had to find a way to do this without undoing his infiniteness. And I checked, there is a word, infiniteness. <laughs> All right. So, so that was logos. Okay? Yeah, that was a slide from the last lesson. All right? Okay. That was the logos. That's what, what came being into his mind the Logos. Now that Logos was all of God, that it could be, that the infinite God could be, except it couldn't be infinite. Okay? Don't worry. Okay? You will, we'll cover this again. Okay? It's not a separate God. The Logos is not a separate God. Okay? From the infinite God. Any more than your thoughts and your plans are a separate person from you, right? Okay? And the Logos of God that came into being in God's mind was God's blueprint or his plan that contained everything that God would do or ever do, all right? And as Brother Jim said um, earlier in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was God, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, all right? 
So once again, the Logos was not a separate God, but an expression of the infinite God into the finite. So the Logos is all of the infinite God possible expressed into the finite. I know I'm redundant here, but I'm trying to make it clear, okay? It was the agency whereby the infinite God could create the finite and still be infinite. And it was also the agency whereby God, the God of love, could relate to and have a relationship with the finite. All right? Still got you all? Okay. Amen. All right. Tonight's lesson. Okay. So, there are only two elements or expressions of God that existed before the creation of time and space. I said two elements or expressions. I'm not saying two persons or two gods, okay? All right, okay. So, number one is who can guess? The I am. Okay, all right. And what is the second one? Logos, all right, okay. His expression as Logos, okay? The I am or the infinite God, and then the second was his expression as Logos. Question, I know I'm getting you think here. Did the expression of God as the Father exist before creation? All right, I like it. I see those those head heads. Good. All right. Okay, we're going to talk about that more. Praise God. You guys have been studying. Praise God. That's awesome. All right. So here's the bottom line that covers this whole lesson on the oneness of God. Are you ready? All right. It's not, it's not going to be on the slide, but I'll tell you. The I am and the Logos is the foundation of who God is. And everything else in the Bible, all the other biblical titles of God... They will point either to the I am or the Logos. And so we really need to understand the foundation of the I am and the Logos because it's all about these two elements. From before creation till the after the end of time. All right? Okay. So now these two elements are not two different gods, but they are two different dimensions of the exact same one God. Now here's something that will help you because it helped me when you try to explain something, you know. The relationship between our body and soul Supplies typology for understanding the relationship between the I am and the Logos. We're going to do some comparisons here. We're going to use typology here to help us understand more the Godhead, okay? You all have a body and a soul, right? Yeah, you're all alive. Praise God, okay? Your soul is in your body, right? Okay? And your body is the dwelling place of your soul, okay? The functions of your body are different from the functions of your soul, right? Your, your will, your emotions, and all that, right? But your body and your soul are not two separate beings, right? Okay. We're sti you're still one person. Yeah, I can see you all. Still one. Amen? Okay. And so is the Godhead, the I am, and the Logos, right? Some light bulbs on. All right, very good. That's an easy way to 
teach them that, okay? Now, we're going to go back to that, but let's talk about parables. I want us to talk about parables, okay? All right. Okay. Because understanding the concept of parables will not only help us to understand the Godhead, but will be a great benefit for us in understanding the Word of God as a whole. Amen? And I pray that this revelation will bless you as much as it has encouraged me. You know, I've noticed, like, my husband, he, he teaches a lot when he uses the parables. And I said, wow, it's kind of cool how, how God gives him that revelation. But you know what God told me? I can give it to you, too. You know? And so I, I hope this will bless you because it really helped me, okay, the revelation of parables, okay? So what is a parable? A parable is a statement or comment that conveys a meaning indirectly by the use of comparison, analogy, or the like. A parable is also an example or illustration from the natural or the temporal realm that is used by God to communicate supernatural or eternal principles. Okay? And the Bible is full of parables. Even those that don't say it's a parable. Okay? All right? A lot of it. A lot of it. Okay? So the Bible is full of parables using natural things he created to illustrate to finite man, to you and I, heavenly principles. Wow, this reminds me of Brother Eli, the revelation he has, huh? And he always has a way of comparing it with the natural, right? It's like, wow, but he just compared it with the natural. But the natural's always there. we got to be open to this, amen? Let God talk to us. It's, it's pretty cool. Amen. All right. For example, we know that man was made... In the likeness and image of God, right? Okay. Therefore, we can use the created being of man, and we have a body, a soul, okay, that being, a human being, as a parable to understand the relationship between the I am and the Logos. Because it's all about the I am and the Logos. We got to get this, okay? So, the I am in the parable of our being is the soul. And the Logos is what? The body or the word made flesh. Yep, it is. You were right. The word made flesh. You know your Bible, Brother Luke. You know your Bible. Yep. Okay. All right. So, yeah, it's easy to remember because we know that the word or Logos became flesh. And so back to the Godhead. The I am... Or the soul of God is not a separate person or personality from his body. And the Logos or the body of God is not a separate person or personality than he is from his soul. As they are two different dimensions of the same exact one God. Amen. All right. And I haven't forgotten about the Father and the Son. We'll, we'll talk about that too, okay? Um, but here we go again. Which one do you think the title of the Father represents? The I Am or the Logos? Uh-huh. All right. Praise God. Woo. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. Awesome. All right, why would God use parables? Okay, I believe that God uses parables to challenge us, challenge us to look for it, okay? So that when we see the correlation, it will increase our understanding of the Word of God like another layer, amen? Praise God. For God uses the natural principles for us to see how it correlates with the spiritual to give us more understanding. So God uses parables to challenge us, but he also uses it 
to test hearts. Okay? To test hearts. We'll read that in scripture here. Matthew 13, 1 to 3. The same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multiples, multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Wow. All right. I have one more scripture here. Okay. Therefore speak I to them in parables. Because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says this. At the time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou has hid these things from the wise and prudent. What's the wise and the prudent? Those who are pursuing God intellectually. So for those who are pursuing God intellectually, he has not revealed, he has revealed them unto the babes. Okay? So the Lord's, the Lord God's use of parables was intentional. They revealed truth to those with eyes to see and ears to hear. And hid truth from those that didn't have spiritually discerning eyes and ears. Lord, open my eyes. Open my ears, Lord. Okay. To help us to become more aware of these parables, here are a few examples of parables that you will find being used in Scripture. Um, natural things with spiritual application. So I'm going to read these. The use of marriage. Okay being a husband, being a wife, families, parenting, being a son, son, being a daughter, the tabernacle, right? That has a lot of correlation there. And the temple that the Jews built, the scriptural laws, spiritual authorities, and we talked about the body and the soul. Water, water is used as a parable, right? One time it's described as a well, another time it's like a river, right? Okay, creation is also used as a parable. The sun, the stars, Agriculture, lots of it, right? Agriculture, seasons, day and night. Sleep is also used as a parable. Growing, aging, and dying is also used as a parable, right? As I die daily, right? Because natural death is intended to help us to understand how to die spiritually, all right? Now the struggle that we humans have with the Lord's parables is that we want to consider them from a literal perspective. We take it literally. For example, Nicodemus, a master teacher of the Jews, could not understand when Jesus told him how to be born again. Like so many verily, verily, he said, right? Still couldn't get it, right? Okay. Um, for he asked him if he was supposed to enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. The Lord was explaining spiritual things to Nicodemus by using natural things that he was familiar with. But Jesus did not expect him to take them literally. <laughs> Notice Jesus' response to him. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? I know the Lord sounded just a little frustrated in his tone, right? With Nicodemus. But God expects us to get it. He does expect us to understand his parables. Okay? All right. So here, when he was talking to Nicodemus, the Lord Jesus Christ was using the birth process, the natural birth process, to teach what the coming New Testament plan of salvation was going to be when it was that time for it to be revealed, right? Now think with me. If God uses the typology of natural birth with spiritual birth, then our salvation process should be somewhat similar to the natural birth, right? Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that God uses, once again, natural principles to see how it correlates with the spiritual so that we can get more understanding and apply his word correctly. All right. So let's use the parable of natural birth with spiritual birth, just to give an illustration here. You know, some people think, a lot of people think, okay, a lot of people think that mainly repentance or confession, right, constitutes being born again, okay? I'm not discounting repentance because we all know that it's very important, right? Okay? But it's not enough by itself. Okay? Because repentance is what? Preparation for the birth. Okay? It starts it. Preparation for the birth. Compared to the natural, it's just getting into the normal birth position. All right? And this is necessary before the mother can start pushing the baby out. The mother say amen. All right. Hi, Sister Shaw. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then it's time for labor. Okay. And some labors are short and some are long. Okay. And I know the guys are saying, thank you, Jesus. Right. Okay. So don't get frustrated when the spiritual baby hasn't come out yet, okay? Just keep doing what you need to do, okay? Amen. And then when the baby comes out from the womb, the doctor expects there to be a sound, right? Because they want to hear the baby cry because that's what signifies the breath of life in the baby. And John 3, 8 says that the sound is the sign of being born again. Amen. And that's also why we pray in tongues every day. Because that's the evidence of spiritual life flowing through us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Now... The ultimate parable, yeah, there's an ultimate parable here. The ultimate parable in the Bible is, guess what? The father and the son, right, okay? Now, take note that Christ is also used, Christ is also a title used that is a synonym with the son, okay? So Christ is the same as the son, okay? And the Lord is a title used that is synonymous with the what? The Father. All right. Don't worry. The more you study this, it's going to become automatic. Okay? All right. Is there a distinction between the Father and the Son? Of course. Right? The title Father refers to God's deity, while the Son refers to God's humanity or more accu accurately referred to as the humanity through which the Father made himself known to men because God did not have any flesh, and flesh in itself cannot represent his deity. Okay, right? Okay. 
All right. So Apostle Paul made it very clear that he believed that God is the Father. Okay? Remember God, right? The infinite, the I am. Okay? God is the Father. Okay? And we can talk about Father now because creation already began, right? Okay. He said in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, 6, For though there he... There be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. You know, when you understand all what these titles mean, you'll only see one. But you'll, you'll, you'll learn, you'll, you'll see the description of God like, oh, wow. Okay, this is the part of God, you know, on the titles, you know. Praise God. All right. And Paul also declared that the Son or Christ, okay, <laughs> is the express image of the Father, which means that the Son is not a different person or deity, but it's the visible image of the invisible God. All right. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3 says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 6. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's why we pray, church. That's why we pray. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Next point. We read a lot in the Gospels how there seems to be a relationship between the Father and the Son, correct? Yeah, it's all over the Gospels, right? They're talking to each other, right? They're, right? There's something there, right? Okay. Not just me, okay? Now, is the relationship between the Father and the Son a literal relationship? Or is it supposed to be a parable? Okay. Let's see what Jesus says. Jesus says, just one Jesus. <laughs> huh. Let's see what Jesus says to his disciples during his last teaching session with them before he prayed in the garden and was later taken and crucified. This is what he told them, his last teaching session. Guess what he told them? These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, or the Greek word there is parables, and we learned the definition of parables. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs or parables, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. It's all about the Father. The Father. The Father, okay? So all of that language between the Father and the Son in the Gospels is a parable, which means it's not supposed to be taken literally. The Lord wants to teach us the principles that this parabolic relationship between the Father and the Son demonstrated. Such as the dying of the flesh to the Spirit, right? 
or how the son depended upon the father and how he was continually led by the father and how he operated in the power and authority of his father or how about the flesh was submitted to the spirit or how the Son of Man had to yield to the Father's will and had to die to his own flesh, both spiritually and physically. Is this making any sense to you? Because if this relationship is a literal thing, then how can you apply the last verse of this scripture here? All right. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet has not known me, Philip? He that had seen me had seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. You remember the the soul and the body, all right? The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. You see, the deity in the Son is the Father. And if you get that, you got it. Because that's a key verse to the father and son confusion. Because you can't take this one literally. You can't. A father physically being inside of a son. It's like my husband being inside of Dylan. That's not physically possible. Because the Lord wasn't talking about a literal relationship between a father and son. But this was only a parable. Amen. All right. So what does this mean? The title of the father is the primary parabolic title of the I am in time and space. The Son or the Christ is the, are the primary parabolic titles of Logos in time and space. And those were not their titles before creation. So God wasn't the Father before creation? Only in his mind. Remember teaching on Logos? How about the son? Wasn't he created before the foundation of the world? He was created in the mind of God. Logos. Logos knew he was going to be robed in flesh. All right. Okay. So here's a common question that we get. Why did Christ or the Son of God pray? Anybody want to answer that? Why? Yes. Because of his flesh. Okay? Very good. Because he was flesh. Okay? All right? Give us some scripture here. Psalm 65, 1, 2. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. All right? How about Hebrews 5? 
So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death and was heard in, in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priests after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Acknowledging the flesh or humanity of Christ does not undeify him why because his flesh was not divine okay it's not a deity for the deity of jesus is the indwelling remember that soul indwelling father okay only flesh prays and god never prays right so God surely did not pray to God, right? Okay? But it was the flesh that prays to God. The man Christ, the Son of God, prayed to God, right? So Jesus had to pray because he had flesh. Okay, the Jesus on earth. All right? Okay. Flesh dies, but God can't die. Okay? So when Jesus died... The God part of him did not die because the deity in him that would allow him to die was the same deity that was going to resurrect him. Amen? All right. Praise God. Then some may ask, if God was in Christ, then whom did he pray to? I'm sure there's a good explanation for that. <laughs> but for the sake of time, okay, I'll give you a short version, okay? But it works just the same, okay? If they ask you this question, just ask them back these two questions, amen? My husband helped me on this one, okay? First one is, do you believe that God is in you? All right? And then, of course, they're going to say, yeah, right? So who do you pray to? All right, that would, that would work. Okay, try it. Amen. Okay. Now we know, we all know this, right, that the name of God is Jesus. Okay? <laughs> Just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Jesus, hallelujah. I know, talking about the great I am, the, the infinite God, Jesus is the name. Okay, Jesus. And we're going to show you how we got to Jesus. Okay, all right. Um, and the common titles of Jesus are Lord and Christ. And we talked about this previous lesson, right? Um, Acts 2.36, that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So those are titles of Jesus, okay? And if you remembered, we studied that the word Lord refers to the Spirit of God. And the word Christ is the Logos, or the Word made flesh. And earlier I mentioned that the title of the Lord is a synonym of the Father. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if the Lord is the Spirit and the Lord is the Father, then the Spirit is the Father. And that's why we can confidently say that the Father or the Spirit of the Father dwells in the Son or in Christ or in the Word made flesh. And because of that, we can also conclude that there is only one Spirit which is the same as the Spirit of the Lord and the Spirit of the Father. Amen? One Spirit. And we'll talk more about the Spirit before I close, okay? Now, what about the titles of the Son of Man and the Son of God? 
There are not two sons or two Christs, okay? But these two titles are referring to the same Christ. Christ is called the Son of God because what? The Logos makes him the Son of God, right? And then Christ is called the Son of Man because of what? Right. Thank you. Because of the mother. All right. Very good. Okay. Because of the mother. Okay. But the deity part of the I am, okay, not, not the Son of God, not the Son of Man. The deity part is the I am or the Father in Christ. Okay. Because the Lord is the Spirit. Okay. The I am, right? Okay. The soul and the body, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Praise God. I, I don't have the time to expound on that, but I think it's clear. Okay. All right. So we are now going to consider earthly titles or other earthly titles and descriptive terminologies that the Bible uses to help us understand how the I am and the Logos, remember it's all about these two, right? Relate to each other in time and space and with us as human beings. In the Bible, there's, signi or there's a signi sorry, significant difference between a name and a title. They're not the same. Not the same. Okay? All right. Let's first talk about the name. The Lord said of his name in Exodus, let's start with the Old Testament, Exodus 3, 15, okay? And God said moreover unto Moses, thou shalt thou, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord. And in the Hebrew, these are four consonants, Y-H-W-H. God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, have sent me unto you, this is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Could you imagine if, if that was going to be those four consonants to say the name and we can't even say it? Right? But God revealed his name, amen? In the New Testament, okay? So that was Old Testament, okay? That was Old Testament, all right? So those were four Hebrew consonants with no vowels. Was unpronounceable for a reason. And I know man try to help God, right? By adding vowels from the word, what? The word Adonai, right? And came up with familiar terms as what? Jehovah, Yahweh, right? But as Bishop would say, anything that's not in the Bible that man added are extra biblical terms. All right. Okay. So I'm not pronouncing that. It's Y-H-W-H. -H. That's the name revealed to, to, to man in the Old Testament. Okay. All right. Now, but we know this. Matthew 1, 21 right? And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We're still talking about the name, okay? So that is the name that we know in New Testament. But did you know the exact literal meaning of that name Jesus in Hebrew? Do you know what it is? That's Emmanuel. Y H W H saves. There's a reason why we couldn't pronounce it. It was not time for the revealed name. Because God does want us to pray in the name of Jesus, right? God wants us to honor his name. So Jesus is the revealed name of God in the New Testament. That was unpronounceable in the Old Testament. And then we've also learned that the name of the Father is Jesus. 
The name of the Son, we already said, is Jesus. And the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. We know the verse for the name of the Father is Jesus. Who, who, who remembers that? All together now. John 5, 43. I come in my Father's name, right? Okay. How about um, the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Comforter. Okay, John 14, 26. Got to know these. Got to know these, okay? They're all the same name, okay? Okay. Um, they put that there. Okay, name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, still Jesus, right? Interesting. They're all the same name. Why are they all the same name? Why? <laughs> because Jesus is the family name of heaven and earth. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 3, 14, 15 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Family name. Our family name's La Chica. Okay, you guys get it. The family name. Family name, Jesus. Not the first name, the family name. That's why for the Father, Son, Holy, it's all the same. Amen? Jesus' name. All right? Therefore, the name of Jesus is the eternal and forever name of God. Amen. And here are some of the variations of that we're still on the name of God, okay? Some of the variations of the name of God in the Bible. I am, okay, I am that I am, okay, the Y-H-W-H, of course, Jesus, okay, we're talking about variation of the name, Lord Jesus, Christ Jesus, and Lord Jesus Christ, okay, all right. Any other word that's used in reference to God, aside from these guys, is not a name, it's a name title title people get confused okay they mix the title with the name title okay and the following are the most biblical titles that are used in regards to the i am okay once again the foundation right the i am or the logos right okay they're right up there i'm going to read them really quick God, Lord, the Almighty, Savior, Master, Rabbi, Teacher, Father, Christ, Emmanuel, Son of God, Son of Man, Holy Ghost, Counselor, the Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Father, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of Jesus Christ, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of His Son, Spirit of Life, Spirit of Truth, Spirit of Wisdom, Spirit of Promise. Titles. Titles. All of these. No, okay. If all of these were names of persons, we have a whole lot of gods. Thank God we know there's one, right? But what are these? These are descriptive titles that are intended in context to focus on some aspect of God. That's the purpose of these titles, not co to confuse us, but to understand our God, the qualities of our God. Jesus' name. All right. And if we're going to rightly divide the word, or what does that mean? To correctly interpret for understanding of biblical principles, every scripture that references one of these titles, take note of this, has to be identified as to the time frame. Because God revealed himself differently in many different time frames. Right? There, remember, there was no title of the Father before creation. Okay? Now they call God Jesus. Now we do, not the I am. Right? Okay? So the time frame, okay? And it's a progressive revelation. And if we want to correctly interpret the scripture, we've got to identify the specific time frame. Any, anytime you see a title in a verse, ask God, okay? 
examine it, study it. What is this time frame? Okay? And this is not just between the Old Testament and New, and New Testament, okay? Or the time of the law or the church age. This could be, this could include before creation, or how about post rapture, or during the millennial reign of Christ, or how about post prophecy, or, 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 or post prophecy time of eternal life, okay? The and that was a time where all written things are fulfilled. We got to know this, right? The titles, if we want to know the real meaning of the titles, all right? The significance of the titles. And that's why we need to be students of the word, amen? So that when we can understand and explain the origin and the purpose of the titles of God, if we study the word, because these are titles and they are not separate persons of the Godhead, all right? I'm going to make a major point on this. It should be noted and never forgotten, okay, I'm quoting Bishop Wright's words, that the purest, least complicated, most direct references to God and the Godhead occurred before and after time, okay? All other descriptions of God and explanations of the Godhead must be harmonized with the declarations and revelations of God as he is the I am in both of these, of those dimensions, okay? And if they don't harmonize, then that description of God or your explanation of the Godhead is incorrect or not biblically sound. Remember we talked about the foundation? All right. All right. Okay. I know I'm past my time. Now, very quickly, what about the Holy Ghost? Let's not forget the Holy Ghost. Okay. The phrase Holy Ghost was never used in the Old Testament. Okay. Never used. The phrase, the phrase Holy Spirit is only used three times in the Old Testament and never in caps. And never in direct reference to the Holy Spirit of the New Testament. Okay? And neither the phrase Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit is ever used in the book of Revelation anywhere. Spirit is where is there. You'll see spirit. Okay? But not Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. And Jesus said that God is a spirit, right? Singular, okay? Because John 4, 24 says that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So every time there is a phrase that says spirit of the Lord, spirit of the Father, spirit of Christ, etc., it's all in direct reference to some aspect of God because there can only be one spirit. And if there is only one spirit, then the spirit in the Father and of the Father is the same spirit that's in the Son and of the Son. Okay? And it's the same spirit that we call Holy Spirit. Not three spirits or separate persons or beings. All right? Ephesians 4.4, 4, you know this. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope for your calling. So take note that the titles Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit are only found in the New Testament because it had a different purpose of God's aspect for that period of time, the church age. And we, I think we understand why, right? Amen. And there's a lot more that can be taught on this subject, but I'm going to conclude with a few more verses here, okay? Colossians 2, 8, 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen? Amen. Beautiful, beautiful verse. Every bit of the quality of the I am God was manifested through the 
logos. Every quality of the I am was manifested bodily in the man Christ Jesus. I said quality because that does not include quantity. Why? Because I am, the I am is infinite. Can't fit in there, right? But today you will read that there's one throne in heaven, amen? And that there's one sitting on that throne, amen? And if we see that one sitting on the throne, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ or the Logos manifesting the I am God for eternity. Revelations 4, 10, 11. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. The four and twenty elders who are these 24 elders the church right we'll teach that another session okay the 20 the four and 20 elders felt fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. One day, church, we are going to see him. And on that day, we won't be wondering who the one true and living God is, because we will know his name. And he will know ours. Hallelujah. And I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. Let's just give, give time to worship God. Thank him for the revelation he has given us. Lord, I pray, oh God, you're covering over your body. Thank you for your revelation. Covering of your revelation over them, oh God. Covering in the name of Jesus. We want to grow in your grace and the knowledge of who you are, oh God. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Would you clap your hands to him, that one that sits on the throne? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. In Jesus' name. What a wonderful revelatory teaching. Amen. I'm so grateful and thankful that you have an appetite to have some deep teaching. Amen. Not just preaching, but deep teaching. You may be seated for a little bit. Any any question tonight? Any question that you may have, Brother Alex? So those are titles that man, in his attempt to define God, added vowels to say J. So J V. What is it? J J V, J H V H. Which you can't pronounce. And then Y H W H, which you can't pronounce. Should not be pronounced. Right, I know some people. You know, we went to the Westminster and they. Because it sounds kind of spiritual, I guess. Yeshua. The guy kept saying Yeshua. I didn't even know what he's talking about, you know. But, but it's not pronounceable for a reason. And we should not really pronounce it. No. I wouldn't. I didn't know either. But now we know. So they, they, they added vowels to be able to pronounce. So, so the 
So the first letter of the Hebrew, I can't remember now, is it uh, Y? Yeah, I think it's Y. Yeah. So, so they're adding, the, 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 the point is they're adding the, 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 uh, the vowels to pronounce it. But think about this. When, when Jacob wrestled with the angel, what did he say? What did he ask the angel? He said, what is your name? Right? He said, what's your name? They didn't know the name. Abraham didn't know the name. Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, they knew the title of God. But that was hidden in the Old Testament. And then he was... In fact, Isaiah 9.6, everybody knows that, right? So Isaiah actually tried his best to describe the name. He said, unto us the sons given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name, he said, shall be called Wonderful Counsel, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of... Those are not names, right? Like my kids call me Papa out of respect, but that's not my name. And... That's why when we pray now, I used to not be comfortable saying Father because of the Trinitarian bent. But really, when you say Father, that is an endearment term of your Papa, if you would, praying to Him, your Father that loves you and cares for you, died for you. So when you say Father, in fact, that's how they prayed in the New Testament, all the apostles. You know, I thank the Father. That's how Jesus prayed. Did that answer your question, hopefully? Yeah. And it's interesting what Sister Jika pointed out, that it's the family name. Jesus is the family name. Have you ever thought about Abraham doesn't have a last name? What's Abraham's last name? Isaac? Jacob? The last names are introduced... The fir first names are introduced rather, you know, later on in, in part of civilization. They usually okay, will we'll, we'll say the first name or, or the last name and then the, the son of Abraham, the, you know, that, that was the family name basically, which is the name of that, that father. And today, the, only the Indonesians actually still have that practice today. The Indonesians today only have one name. My 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 brother in law is Indonesian, married to my youngest sister, and his first his name, which is his last name and first name, is Handi, H A N D I. And then when when they came over here to the states, and he was asked, "Hey, what's your name?" His name is Handi. What's your last name? That's my name. No, no. What's your so? What's your first name? No, that's my name. They go, we can't have that. So what do you want? Do you, do, do you want a last name or first name? He goes, no, that's my name. So, so what do you want? He goes, well, just, just put it down twice. <laughs> so in his passport, it's Handi, Handi. That's his name. Why, ch right? Why change your name? That's your name. I know some that immigrate from other countries come here. You, you actually, when you get a citizenship, you, that's your, your not, by not paying more money to change your name. And I've got relative that changed their name or last name and they actually wanted to ask me if I want to change my name because my real name is Horacio Narboneta La Chica Jr. That's my legal name. It's too much. Too many vowels, too many consonants. But at least you can pronounce it. Amen. Any other questions? So, so there's there's old. We're talking about Old Testament. There's Old Testament says that the that the prophets or some actually were filled with the Spirit of God, 
right? Have you ever been asked, well, why were they filled with the Spirit? They were filled with the Spirit and they prophesied. In the Old Testament, how can they be filled with the Spirit if the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified? And so that teaching, that slide, answers that question. It is not the same. It is not the infilling of the Holy Spirit like what we have today in the New Testament. That did not happen until Jesus died, right? Have you ever been asked that question? Because I've been asked that question. Right. They never received the promise. And what's the promise? The promise of Abraham is that the Gentiles might receive the Spirit. That's Galatians 5.20, I think. And so, and that's another topic where the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost will happen because that promise has not yet been fulfilled. In Jesus' name. Amen. That's why we baptize in the family name, Jesus. And, and you got to realize, too, a lot of those psalms are prophetic. It talks about the Messiah. A lot of David's psalms are prophetic by nature. So it's referring also to pointing towards Jesus. So the focus of the Bible is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything from the Old Testament points to him. Everything after him points back to him. Good, good thoughts, good questions. Anybody else? How far is your study of God, of who God is? I hope this whet your appetite. Right, you, you, so God, we all know that God is eternal, right? And one day you're going to be eternal, right? Yeah? That's not a trick question. The angels are eternal. Right? But there's only one infinite one. Which is God. Have you ever wondered that if Lucifer was in heaven, you know, he said, thou art the anointed cherub. It talks about his qualities, his tablets and musical instruments as part of his body. And if if he can see God, would he be that stupid to think that he could actually overthrow God? J just a little thought here to whet your appetite you could study more. How can you how can you see infinity? Can you see infinity? You know, this, this uh, Einstein actually have a theory in, in, in his mind that God gave him, and he was a Jew, by the way, a German Jew. And he said that two parallel lines at some point, if you stretch them long enough, it actually intersects. They're actually not parallel. So if that stretch long enough, at some point, it intersects. And that's an amazing observation that he has because eventually it all goes back to its creator. It all goes back to its source. And here, to, to even whet your appetite, if you read Hebrews chapter 7, and I know Sister Chica talks on it a little bit, he talks about Melchizedek. He has no father, no mother. He's eternal. Now, who is that? Who's Melchizedek? That he's so great that Abraham paid tithe in, to him. Right? Who is that? I'm not going to answer it. You study that. Father, we thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. I pray, God.
that this will give us the spiritual appetite, Lord, to know you, to get to know you, to want to get to know you, to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, O oh God, that as workmen, as laborers, that we will not be ashamed, that we can rightly divide the word of truth, to give a reason to every man that asks of the reason of the hope that is within us, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal your word to us, not through our intellect, God, because, God, you will hide it to, from us if we study it, study it intellectually. Help us, Lord, to resist studying the Word through our brain that we're putting together a puzzle. But help us to study with the Holy Ghost within us. The Father reveals the Son. And the Son, the Father, that we may do the same, O oh God, that we would put the time in prayer that you would reveal your word to us in the name of Jesus. Let me, let me just say this as we go into that journey of studying. Sister Chica had that slide that God hides his word from those that he said he hides it from the wise and the prudent. Those that intellectually studies the word, ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. And, and we could easily fall into that as we study the word. I'm not saying not use your brain. But if you're studying without connect, connecting with him, that's a recipe for false doctrine. You're, you're studying by your brain. God's not a respecter of persons. He will reveal himself to those who are hungry. It, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be dumb either. <laughs> but you just got to be hungry. So when you study, don't, don't study like you're, oh, I'm going to take the scripture, and I, I'm going to connect it with this, and I'm going to, I, I, th that, that's wrong. You don't connect anything. You study, you pray, Lord, what is this? What is it talking about? And, and, and God will reveal it to you. Well, that takes too long, Pastor. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Because this is a relationship. You put in time if you want to get to know him. If you don't, you just know about him. You don't know him. Then he doesn't know you. But he is, if you study it out, he is a comforter. He is a deliverer. He is a healer. He is the great I am. He is that and more. And when we get to heaven, the only representation of God, the infinite God that we will see, is in the face or the person of Jesus Christ. That's the only visible representation that we can comprehend. Because he's infinite. We can't even understand that. Hallelujah. What a mighty God. What a mighty God. You will never be bored in heaven. If you're bored now, study the Word of God. It will take all of eternity to know Him. And that won't even be enough. You'll, we'll just get to know Him and know Him and know Him forever. And that will be just exciting. It's like watching a, a live movie about God, just knowing Him and knowing Him and knowing Him and knowing Him. Hallelujah. Can you worship Him tonight, Father? I thank you. I feel gratitude in this place, Lord. I feel revelation in the house. Thank you, God, for revealing Yourself to us, for choosing us, Lord, that we are able to comprehend with the spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church in Jesus' name. Now realize this as you study. The primary way of God giving you revelation is through the rhema or the spoken word. You understand the spoken word? Versus written, right? Because I think John was the one that says, 
He said, there are many other things that the Lord did, that Jesus did, that if every one of them were be written, he said, perhaps the world would not even be enough to contain all the books. So we have enough of the written word, and it's the rhema or the spoken word that gives it life and revelation. It will never contradict it. And so when you study, it's that rhema that gives you direction. You've got to hear the voice of God. That, that's why I keep saying this. Your life is spent and should be spent learning to hear the voice of God. That's your goal. That's your highest spiritual skill. If you have that, God could lead you. If you have that, God could speak to you. And it's always growing. It's always growing. And that's how you study the Word of God. He'll speak to you. In your prayer time, He'll speak to you. You'll be, you'll be thinking about Scripture you don't understand. And in your prayer time, He'll begin to tell you what it is. That's why when you pray, have your phone. Not check social media, but get a note app or something. Amen. Amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name, we'll see you Sunday. Amen. Praise God.